forever. Dog. Dreams are always for us. They're never against us. They're never showing us or giving us information that's about our demise. They're showing us where we're constricting and afraid and saying no to life so that we might say yes. That's why what I do is helpful because your dream is telling you where are you afraid and my work comes in and says, well, even your work, not just my work, it's like anybody looking at a dream and playing with it is looking at the place where they're saying no to life and by looking at that place where you might be saying no, your yes is right beyond it. He was a flapper in a past life. He's a comedian in this life. He's got a podcast about it Everything he loves Magic, magic psychics, psychics, mediums, astrology Beyond Hi, I'm Mike Kelton And you're listening to Hello, friends, and welcome to the season one finale of Beyond. Beyond! Thank you. Wow, what a wild journey this has been. And before we get into the season finale, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you listeners for being such an important part of this season. The emails, DMs, and good end I felt from you has honestly meant the world. So genuinely, thank you, Bish. And today's episode is really a tribute to you, the listeners. What is today's episode about? Good question again, Carol. It's all about dreams. Initially, I didn't think of this as a topic for season one, but something happened throughout releasing the pod that really shook me. If you remember in episode one, Asa, the magical medium, told me that I would have vivid dreams following my reading. But what I started hearing after releasing the pod was that you, our listeners, were also having vivid dreams. I don't know if we opened up a portal to another dimension or if Alex, our producer here at Forever Dog Soundscapes, were just making your imagination light up the way my face lit up when I heard the season four announcement for Drag Race All-Stars. Anyway, you were having dreams and I was interested. So this episode, we're coming full circle with the submitted dreams from you, the listeners. But not only that, we have a world-renowned dream expert in the studio who's going to listen to your dreams, interpret them, and then give you some advice on what these dreams might mean. Also, listen to the end, because of course, there was a through line with these listener-submitted dreams, and Andrew might say I'm connecting loose dots, but again, babe, you decide for yourself, okay? I don't have to. Um, This is me in the studio with our expert du jour, Michael Lennox, who's here in his capacity as our dream expert, or in his language. Here's my language. Spiritual teacher, Mm -hmm. colon, psychologist, astrologer, and expert in dreams and dream interpretation. Amazing. That's my tagline. My tagline is, flapper in a past life, but you already knew that. Spiritual teacher first, because that's the general, like, that's uh-huh. what I'm here to do. Inspire yes. and teach around uh-huh. connecting to your deeper spirituality. Uh-huh. And then I like people to know I'm a psychologist first, because that takes the woo-woo off. Uh-huh. But astrology is my go-to. And then dreams I put as last only because of the rhythm of the sentence. Psychologist, astrologer, and expert of dreams, dream interpretation. And how did you get into this? How I first ex- discovered that dreams were a thing was uh-huh. really, literally, all about the Fiddler on the Roof uh-huh. album. My mom had the show album to Fiddler on the Roof, and we were a music household. Uh-huh. And so every weekend morning, uh-huh. uh, music would play. My mom played the Fiddler on the Roof uh, show album. And on that show album, there's a dream sequence. It's a big part of the uh-huh. show. Mm-hmm. And on the album, there's actually dialogue where Golda says to Tevya, tell me what you dreamed, and I will tell you what it meant. So mm-hmm. I heard that phrase, mm-hmm. you know. A thousand times uh-huh. from being, you know, a little, little boy up until, you know, leaving the house at 18. So that idea lived in me in this quirky little way. So cut to I'm about 15 years old. Uh-huh. The uh, Freud's interpretation of dreams shows up on my mom's shelf because she's in school. I read it. I'm interested in dreams. I think dreams are fascinating. And I get from reading that book that dreams can actually be held in high regard and something can come of looking at them and interpreting Mm -hmm. them. And you know what happens out in the world. People say every, you know, school, office, everybody, I had the craziest dream last (laughs) night and I remembered Golda. Uh Tell me what you dreamed and I'll tell you what it meant. So first off, we love Michael and we love musicals and we love dreams. 
Michael went on to explain what dreams are and why they can maybe be important to us. Dreams are stories. They're told in the language. The language is the language of symbols. The meaning behind a symbol is built into what it is and what it does. It's not a mystery. I'm here. It's a cup of water I'm mm -hmm. holding. The symbol is in what the cup does. It's a container of something I need for life. The, ex the elixir of life that water is, I can draw to me using this cup. So if the cup is broken in the dream, then it's a story about my incapacitation around drawing to me that which I need mm. to sustain life. The, the gift that I have is not that I know things that you don't know. I know what you know. You know what I know. Mm -hmm. The gift is I can do it so fast uh -huh. that we can have an experience of you telling me your dream and me saying, tell me what your dreams and I'll tell you what it meant. <laughs> tell me what you dream and I'll tell you what they meant. We'll also be on a Beyond Swag t-shirt available at some point on an Etsy page somewhere on the internet. Through the work that you've done... Um, what is one of the most interesting stories you have about someone who has had a dream, someone you've been able to help, uh, maybe, yeah. you know, out there while just something sure. really interesting for our listeners? Yeah, before yeah, yeah. There's actually a into. story. I mean, it, in some ways it might even be tired by now um, because I use it so often. Um, it was just a fascinating and uh, easily identifiable moment of change for the client. That's an edit point. There's nothing I like better than people telling me where to edit. So we did do an edit, but not exactly what Michael thought. Beep, boop, beep. Okay, back to the story. So this woman comes to me. She was actually a referral from a dear friend who knew my work. And um, we connect and she starts telling me about these dreams that she's now been having recurring regularly for a couple of weeks. And she's really distraught. She's a young woman, I should preface, that mm -hmm. she's a young woman in her 20s. Not married, not a mother, but... Uh, as a young woman in her 20s, that could be uh, something that might happen to her one day. Um, but the dreams are that she's giving birth to babies and then killing them. Now, they're vivid. They are the same thematic birthing and killing, but they're really dark, bloody. One of them, she actually twists. I love this one. She twists the head off the baby like she's wringing something, you know, like, opening a melon or I don't know what I can't think of it. I mean, she's twisting the head off and blood is spurting. She's terrified of these dreams because they're vivid and they're coming at her without, you know, without, you know, end over this period of weeks. And of course she knows that they have some meaning, but she doesn't know what they mean. So she's terrified that it means that there's some horrible, you know, murderous, you know, rage inside of her. So I introduce her to two spiritually oriented, universal symbolic meanings of babies and murder. Babies, new, new stuff, new possibilities, new potentiality that is in existence. So that means it's an idea that's in form, but still nation, still able to grow into something else. Um, she takes that in. And then I explain murder. Death is a beautiful symbol, always. Death is directly connected to rebirth and we don't exist consciousness does not exist outside of death and rebirth that's how we were able to come in and create this thing called consciousness and so death is a beautiful symbol in a dream and when it's murder when it's deliberate then the dreamer the witness the person having the dream is deliberately choosing to create some sort of death space through which something new can be born well she flips out because she's a writer on a project in a tv sit writing room having to constantly throw out first drafts and she it's her first time doing this kind of work she's totally confronted by what it's like to write a draft and have it thrown away to to write a new one and it's showing up in her dream state as her babies and then murdering them but once that happens she has this epiphany of oh my god i'm just in my creative process and it opened her up to have a successful experience of that instead of a torturous one wow it makes so much sense, of but course. also like I can imagine being this woman and having yes. these dreams and just feeling like there's an omen, something bad is going to happen. I blah blah blah. These things could happen in real life. But we it, have tremendous superstitions built into our acculturation, not only our modern culture of that, but from all sorts of other, you know, uh, 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 traditions where dreams are bad omens and and portent terrible things. And we have an understanding of the unconscious that's you know. Uh, 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 modern and, and, and ubiquitously understood. And so, yes, you put those two things together and it was bad news for her.
her. But it was great news. Dreams are always for us. They're never against us. They're never showing us or giving us information that's about our demise. They're showing us where we're constricting and afraid and saying no to life so that we might say yes. That's why what I do is helpful because Mm. your dream is telling you, where are you afraid? And my work comes in and says, well, even your work, not just my work. It's like anybody looking at a dream and playing with it is looking at the place where they're saying no to life. And by looking at that place where you might be saying no, your yes is right beyond it. Then Michael went on to have the absolute best explanation for why he lives his life as a spiritual being. And oh my God, It's absolutely and honestly kind of similar to the way I look at it. So here she blows. And maybe this is you, Carol. Listen, first of all, is any of this true? I don't know. Is it true that our (laughs) souls want to evolve? How the fuck would I know? Right? But I'm going to choose to live my life as if that's so. Why? Because I get incredible pleasure out of living that way. I free myself from anxiety and depression. I rise up in my energetic sensation of this body that gives me so much pleasure along the way. And I have better relationships with myself, my family, and everybody else as a result of looking at this consciousness stuff. So I'm going to keep going with the idea that my soul is singing to me through my dream state. If it helps you, then why would you not? Why would would you not? not? If it's helping you and not harming anyone else, then why would you not? Okay, now that we know what Michael's background is and what dreams are and how wild and funny Michael is and how he thinks this could all be some bullshit hoax, let's get to your dreams. Now, this first one was submitted by a listener in Germany. His name is Patrick, and his dream is really fascinating. So thank you for submitting, or as they say in Germany, merci beaucoup, babe. Okay, here's the dream. Hello, I'm Patrick. I'm 35 years old and I'm from Berlin, Germany. So quickly to the dream. It was around about 4 a.m. in the morning and I woke up. I woke up because my heart was missing a beat. It was beating unregular and um, nothing to worry. Some people have it. It's totally normal, but I woke up by it. I was a little bit like, ooh, what's wrong with my heart? Oh, it's beating unregular. What I try now is to stay calm and relax and breathe and then it will go away. As I did that, I must have fallen back asleep again. So I started in in this dream where I was in a room. I can't even describe the room if, if there was nothing on the walls. It was just like a room. I can't even say if I have been in this room before. It felt normal. So nothing strange. And in this room was a big mirror. And somehow I knew when I look in the mirror, I see myself, but I was scared of looking at myself, which is really strange. And I walked somehow to um, to this mirror and I looked down because I didn't want to look up. Because somehow I knew it's scary or it scares me. I don't know. And... By thinking that, I must have woken up again and kind of was in my mind or I'm not sure if it was, if I was clear in my head again or if I was totally woken up, it felt like I was out of the situation. And then I was just thinking, oh, actually you should look at it and um, look at yourself and look at the mirror and don't be scared of it. And I must have fallen back into sleep, back to the same dream, was back in the room and was back in the mirror. I was really scared and um, didn't want to look in the mirror. And I looked into the mirror and basically I looked at myself. The thing was I looked normally, there was nothing strange about myself. What was a little bit weird was like the eyes, I have brown eyes and the, the eyes, they were a little bit shade of darker and then I was because I was scared and I didn't want to look at myself, I was just forcing myself to look myself in the eyes in the mirror. So it was basically a stare down with myself in the mirror. And what happened in the stare down where I was just there and like kind of scared and looking and really like staring down myself and trying not to put the like the focus on something else. I felt like kind of falling, kind of like something is getting sucked out of it, like a kind of fear crept up in in my body, like I'm disconnecting somehow to myself. And 
I don't know, I was thinking like, oh my God, am I dying now? Am I, am I falling? It was such a straight, strange feeling. It was not a feeling like, oh my God, I'm, 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 I'm so scared. I was scared, but it felt like I'm, I'm disconnecting to my body and I'm, I'm going in a different plane or I'm going at a different place or anything. And the more I stared, the more the feeling came and the bigger it got kind of the, the void or the, the suction, what it was. And then I got so scared and um, I woke up by it. And then I was awake and I was kind of kind of breathing and um, was just like, fuck, what happened? And it was so strange. And after that, like, I remembered I had this dream several times. Not that I looked at myself, but somehow I've been at, in situation, in dreams or something. And there's this point where I'm feel like I'm letting go and letting myself or letting my, my spirit or go. And then I'm always too scared to let it go too much because I'm, I'm thinking that, oh my God, I'm dying or I'm not coming back into this body or I don't know. And it's really strange and um, somehow I'm freaked out by it. And I'm not sure if it means like if I would let myself go and don't get like clear in the head if I'm really dying then, if you can die in a dream or if I would fall or if I would disconnect from my body then and I could myself, I don't know what it means. Um, maybe um, that's something you would be interested in um, discussing in your podcast and it would definitely interest me because I would love to know what's wrong with me or why I'm having this um, reoccurring dream. Um, yeah, that's all for me. And I say bye from Germany. Bye. <laughs> Dude, you could not have picked a more perfect dream to start this conversation off. I, I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed at all of the different threads that you and I could talk about, about what this dream is reflecting about consciousness itself. And yeah, and then there's a whole sort of narrative with just, you know, talking to Patrick about his experience. Let's start with the mirror. Everything right. is a mirror. It's, mm -hmm. It is a trope, actually, of spiritual, psycho-spiritual consciousness. So it's not just a spiritual idea. It's also an idea in, in psychology that mm -hmm. everything is a mirror. Some people take this very, very literally from a place of like energetic holographic consciousness, that there really is only ever one of us here, and that each of us are these individualized expressions of this great divine mystery that we're living in, mm -hmm. that we're all one and a part of, but source energy it. type of right, and yeah. that the way we have this experience is to look at the world as a mirror. When one practices that as an actual, again, I'm going to use the term psycho spiritual because I don't mm -hmm. want it. I want to incorporate both the ideas mm -hmm. of cogent psychological principles of oh, I have I have thoughtful wounds, I want to heal them, mm -hmm. uh, or the spiritual energetic woo woo part of it. Seeing the world as a mirror is how to live more connected. Uh -huh. that, that 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 you let go of blame consciousness when you're you know in the mirror. Think uh -huh. about it in relationship uh -huh. when you realize it's a mirror. It's not like you've done something terrible that's made me unhappy. Uh -huh. It's like oh you're doing this and I'm having this reaction response. So it's having empathy. Yes, having empathy. It's also a way to. I was at a retreat just the other day, uh, uh, last week, uh, facilitating or co-facilitating, and a woman was having a big, you know, conflict emotionally. And I, I, I knew to ask. I said, "Have you ever done any mirror work?" And mm -hmm. she said, well, "No. What is that?" It's like, well, when you stand in front of the mirror and just mm -hmm. look at yourself in the eyes and tell yourself, "I love you." Uh -huh. I, most people have terrible challenge uh -huh. doing that, but everything is in that work. Every, mm -hmm. Everything about accepting oneself, healing shame. Mm -hmm. You can't look at yourself in the eyes and say, I love you and feel something, respond to that if there's shame in the way. So mirror work is is incredible way to you know move through consciousness. But this particular, I love this. I'm up, then I'm asleep. I'm up and then I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. So even that has some symbolic meaning of the idea of what do we call someone who has had a spiritual epiphany? We call them woke. Mm -hmm. They have woken up. Mm -hmm. So the idea of being up and back, back asleep and then up and then back asleep, even that has symbolic meaning of Patrick's journey of I'm diving into connection. I'm pulling back from connection. I'm mm -hmm. diving into connection. I'm pulling back from connection. Why would I pull back? Because it's scary. We all have this ego mind voice. I call it the mind that orients us to time, space, and identity. I know who I am. I know where mm -hmm. I am. I know when I am. And that piece of our consciousness we think is 
everything. Mm -hmm. But in consciousness, consciousness, that is not only not everything, it's nothing. It's non-existent. It doesn't exist. It has a purpose. It keeps us Mm -hmm. from bumping into the furniture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the funniest that's what it's that's for that's the funniest way i've heard it described but you know what you're right <laughs> that's what the mind is for it's like oh yeah. okay i'm michael that means i know who i am i know mm-hmm. where i am i'm in i'm in new york city i know where i have to be at 10 a.m mm-hmm. to record this podcast and people take it very far with like and i'm a person who's wearing a cute lululemon top but what most people get stuck in mm-hmm. is they think that that mind is who they are mm-hmm so thoroughly that when we begin to let that go through spiritual work, maybe some therapy, maybe some plant medicine stuff, you know, whatever it is that's Mm -hmm. pulling you along your path, one of the things that's going to occur is that you're going to let that ego mind dissolve, and that feels like death. Mm. And it is to lean in the direction of shadow, and shadow being the sort of catchword for fear, mm-hmm. doubt, lack, shame. So separation. is that what is that what Patrick's darker eyes were? Yeah, mm. an incorporation of shadow. Interesting. Look scary is good because it's you have to go into the That's darkness right. to like come out into the That's light. Right. I mean, when I first heard this earlier this morning, I thought to myself, uh, this was. I, honestly, my first thought was something to do with like him disconnecting in a bad way, but I think it's more of it's connect, it's disconnecting to connect. He's thinking it means disconnection in a bad way as mm-hmm. well. He's also thinking that if he surrenders, he's going to die. I've heard this dream and iterations of it thousands of times. Mm. Not even in dreams, but people just saying, yeah, I meditated and I, I saw this light and these swirls and I got scared. And I thought to myself, I would think, what? Yeah, yeah. That's what you're doing this for. That's Kundalini, bitch. Yes, that's yes. exactly right. Yeah, That's exactly uh-huh. right. When uh-huh. you do those meditative works and you uh-huh. put in the hours of effort to free up your mechanism, mm-hmm. it starts to spin and shake and move and, and feel blissful. And your dreamland will be called upon to show you where you're afraid. So what Patrick mm. is afraid of is that as he increases his spiritual connection, his little mind with a small M mm-hmm. has to dissolve. Letting go of that will feel like a death because that little mind will argue against being dissolved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So, Patrick, thank you for sending your dream. And babe, let go and let source energy, I guess. It seems like your fears of letting go are keeping you from something. And maybe by stopping judging yourself and just allowing yourself to freely feel or trust, that might allow you to be reborn. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I do think it's going to be good regardless. And I also think by even submitting this dream, it shows a level of openness to share and talk about this stuff. So I bet you're on your way. Love, Delilah. That's an American radio host who says nice things to strangers somewhere listening. We at Beyond Love, Delilah. Delilah, if you're listening, we love. Okay, more dreams. Here's another one I thought was a pretty beautiful and a, a different energy. Hi, my name's Liv. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm in Eugene, Oregon. A loved one of mine, Catherine, passed tragically by suicide September 30th, 2017. I dreamt of her five days later. We were in a large clearing like a meadow, sitting side by side on a bench. She was holding my hand, rubbing it. In our conversation, she answered each of the major questions I was more or less obsessing over since she had passed. Did she feel any physical pain? And is she with her mom, who passed tragically in a car accident a year or so before Catherine died? I know we talked about other things, laughing together, but the answers she gave me to these questions are the only specific details of the conversation I remember. No, she did not feel any physical pain. And yes, of course, she's with her mom. I'm sure this is because that's what I needed in order to evolve through my process of grief. We hugged, she put her head on my shoulder, and I woke up instantly feeling a calmness and clarity I hadn't felt since before she passed. I knew without a doubt it was her. I shared my dream with a close friend that day who told me they dreamt of Catherine earlier in the week. They experienced the same meadow-like clearing, and Catherine was wearing the exact same outfit as in my dream, down to the tiniest details. 
This solidified my knowing my dream of her was a special one. First of all, I love that Catherine is being economical in her wardrobe. (laughs) It's like she picked an outfit that she could visit everybody in. (laughs) Something simple and tasteful, I hope, and comfortable. (laughs) I'm sure. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting is hearing Liv um, walk through their perspective. One perspective that they gave was, I'm sure that this was because I needed help with my grief. Now, built in there into that statement is a dismissal. Mm. of the spiritual aspect of it. Now, I wouldn't dismiss it. I would move in that direction and say, yes, of course, part of your experience was that ego mind we were talking about with Patrick. Mm -hmm. That part of us is grieving as well. Mm -hmm. And that piece needs to make some sense of grief in order for it to feel more comfortable and relaxed. But I've heard enough of these visitation dreams to know the distinction between a dream that's chaotic and story-like where anything can happen and probably will, and a visitation dream, which has always got the same features. One is it always takes place in one location. It's not chaotic and doesn't visit other places. Number two, the person is generally just simply present. And if there's any communication, it is simple or, or, or singular in its expression. So often it's not even verbal. It's like, oh, all is well, or all is love, or something like this. And even in this, though there was laughter and other interactions, the only real communication was those, the answers to those salient questions. Was it painful, and are you with mom? Um, which, of course, is the answer, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's no pain. Why would there be? It's something that is a mystery to us, but it's probably spectacular, uh-huh. right? And the idea is that everybody who passes becomes an ancestor, including us. Mm-hmm. So when we pass, we will become ancestors mm-hmm. as well. So that's built into the idea that, of course, she's with her mom, because mm-hmm. that's part of what we think probably is going on. Why do we think those things are probably going on? Because people for millions of years have been having dreams of people mm. who have passed. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, there's, there's, you know, history mm-hmm. <laughs> to this yeah. idea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I have, I have heard this experience over and over again and, and had this experience at least once in my own mm-hmm. life that leads me to believe bona fide, this is a thing. It's not a, the same kind of a dream as some unconscious processing Uh that might be happening with a dream about the clown car and the milkshake Mm -hmm. and the, you know, mm, (laughs) this is a, 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 an actual phenomenon that occurs because the ego mind that orients to time, space and identity that can't see the multidimensional energies that we embody Mm -hmm. when that is asleep, we are open. The, the real nugget Mm -hmm. is the, with the, that, Knowing without a doubt that that was Catherine is the hope, is the mm-hmm. healing, is the tether of connectedness that is the only thing that ultimately can get us through grief. Now, I think mm-hmm. if we spiritually bypass that, I think we're, 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 we're cutting ourselves short of the experience that grief can really bring us. You know, that mm-hmm. is, if it's, oh, they're in a better place. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's fine if you think that they're in a better place, totally. but just don't move past the, oh my God, I can't believe they're not in this place. Totally. And then yeah. you can get to they're in a better place. But yes. if you go too fast to that, then you don't get the juice that the shadow, rage, sadness, grief, and anger uh-huh. has. But when you have an experience like this that Liv has had, then they can be carried through that experience through the hope that's mm. in the phenomena that occurred. So for this, it almost was a healing message for Liv. Absolutely. It sounds Absolutely. like it was a visit. It was a visitation. Yep. So the spirit of Catherine came through to you to offer you some peace. That's right. And to, mm-hmm. to yeah, to buy mm-hmm. showing yet another living human that the veil between this life and what comes after is not as, you know, thick as yes. anybody believes. Yes. I want to thank Liv for sending this one in and thank Catherine for coming in and making a cameo in the dream and therefore in season one of Beyond. I hope Michael's analysis, Liv, gave you some further peace of mind that Catherine is at peace and probably with you when you need her. Maybe she's one of your spirit guides. I know that I have had those dreams with my grandpa Bob and you know grandpa Bob is literally hanging out with us all the time. So Catherine, what's up girl? And thanks again, Liv. Now, this one is, I'm going to read it to you. So it's my good friend who I, doing this podcast has made us connect. Um, And we kind of lost touch after college. And then we hung out with each other. And then he listened to the podcast. I'm going to read you. He wrote it and I'm going to read it. Uh, Hi, Mike. 
I know you're working on your dream special right now, and I wanted to send you one of my dreams I've had since listening to your podcast. Chris and I started listening to your podcast a little over a month ago when we were on a road trip to Florida. First of all, kudos to you. We love your podcast. Oh, God bless. Reviewed it, gave it five stars. We don't need that stuff. I love you. Second, I had the craziest dream for the first few weeks after I started listening to the podcast. I typically don't have dreams that can easily easily be recalled or dream with much significance. However, listening to this podcast, my dreams seemed to be amped up and supercharged. I had one dream in particular I wanted to tell you about because I found it to be particularly significant. The details are slightly fuzzy, but I'm pretty sure I was visited by this kid that made my elementary years pretty miserable. Background. I switched elementary schools in fourth grade. Previously, it was a, I was at a school that required school uniforms. So on my first day of public school, I was so excited to choose my own outfit for my first day of school. A real choose your own adventure moment. And obviously, being a budding homosexual, I was ready to really express myself. So on the first day of school, I chose what I deemed to be the best costume for the day. A pair of old navy overalls and a long sleeve tie-dye t-shirt in royal hues of violet and teal with a giant peace sign on the front. My hair was carefully parted down the middle, and I looked perfect. Anyway, everything seemed to go swimmingly until P.E., where we were instructed to divide into two teams, boys and girls. I followed instructions and took my place on the boys' side of the basketball court. It was at this time that a boy named Nelson pointed at me and yelled for everyone to hear. Why are you over here? You're a girl. Get on your side. I was devastated. Cut me to the core. I couldn't cry. I just took it and tried to ignore it. It's funny how small acts of bullying can last a lifetime. As a young gay kid trying to suppress my dainty habits and mannerisms, he had sniffed me out. I honestly still look back on that day as sort of a key moment in my development, and the image and words, however insignificant to adult Jonathan, will forever be embedded in my mind and had a huge impact on a little boy Jonathan. So cut to October 2018. Chris and I got married in front of our families and friends in Arkansas. Any wedding is special, but for Chris and I, combining our Southern Christian families and feeling the amount of love that surrounded our nation, our union, sorry, felt particularly significant. So here we are, driving to Florida, floating on a cloud of love, listening to Beyond with Mike Kelton, and about to enjoy a week of relaxing at my parents' house with our goddaughter and friends. The dreams kicked in, and I was visited by Nelson. Nelson passed away a few years ago. I believe in a homicide situation, but I don't know all the details and haven't thought of him probably since I learned of his passing. But he was very vivid in my dream a few weeks ago. I don't remember our entire conversation, but he told me a story about feeling unloved and how he would seek attention, negative or otherwise, to fill some sort of void. He didn't apologize for what he said to me, but he made me realize just how different our upbringings were. Nelson talked to me for a while, and again, nothing was extraordinarily significant. However, what was significant was Nelson was wearing the same Old Navy overalls I was wearing (laughs) the first day of fourth grade. I truly believe that somehow Nelson was coming back to sort of give me a blessing on my wedding. Oh, I'm going to cry. Or apologize or something. Maybe I'm reading into it too much. I don't know. But I think his visit was perfectly timed around a period in my life where I felt so sure of myself, my relationship, and the love that was not only shared between Chris and I, but our circle of family and friends. To be visited by him now and be reminded of the insecurities I felt growing up and be able to now reflect on all of that is truly a full circle moment that is kind of sweet. Again, I don't know what all of this is supposed to mean, and I'm not someone who typically believes in all of this, but I found this to be interesting. It makes me think about being open to other visits or energies. So in summary, thanks beyond by Mike Helton. I'm a believer. Keep up the good work. XX Jonathan. Is it lost on you that we started with a dream about a mirror? And the third dream or dreamer that we're looking at is a mirror reflection of Jonathan seeing Nelson wearing the exact same outfit. Wow. Okay. So okay, remember, this is operating chills. on every level. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's start with that. Let's also add that 
when the questions are, oh, I don't know if this is a visitation, is this a this, is this a that, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't know. Um, and I always say that it's important to me to embody the idea that it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I will add that the idea that Nelson is actually, you know, transitioned on in, mm -hmm. in our waking life, in our three-dimensional world, indicates the possibility that his energy, his spirit is actually, was visiting Jonathan mm -hmm. in that dream. That, that, that part of, <clears throat> you know, what he was experiencing with Nelson being present may have concluded Nelson's actual energetic, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the wedding is the key thing in this narrative. The fact that the wedding and the joining together of families and the healing that that wedding represents has a contrast point. And that contrast point is that first day of public school. That's the day where some piece of Jonathan was sort of strangled. Mm -hmm. And it has a name, Nelson, and it has an outfit. <laughs> mm -hmm. It has a moment where in that exchange, Jonathan took a part of himself, the more expressive, sensitive, free, free to express, mm -hmm. free to be everything that he built in, pre-installed, got killed that day by the interaction with Nelson. And it got completely healed, or rather almost completely healed by the wedding. Mm -hmm. I'm free to be who I am. I'm free to love who I love. And I'm free to bring this and celebrate this love with two families coming together. But there's a little piece of the unconscious that needs some added work. In other words, the idea, everything I just described as a healing is a complete conscious healing. So the unconscious needs some work too, because down in the threads of the unconscious, that wound is still vibrant and alive. Mm -hmm. And Nelson isn't Nelson. It's the aspect of Jonathan that got strangled off. And that aspect is still wearing a, a pair of overalls and a tie-dyed shirt because it got, it got strangled in that moment. So it, it stays it in the same there. way. It stayed there. It's almost like um, in like, I think, horror movies or things when spiritual things, you'll see the, the adult meet the child yes. where the trauma happens. The, where the trauma happened, And they speak to that kind of, That's right. that person and heal that so then they can move on. They can move on. By the way, that happens in therapy consultation uh -huh. rooms as well as yes. movies. Okay, great. <laughs> it, it does work that way. Great, great, great. It really, really, really does work that way. Part of Jonathan's consciousness and psyche was still there. And in this dream exchange, yes, maybe Nelson's energy came in to help that healing occur. Uh -huh. The dream was the deeper unconscious unraveling of the shame that got triggered in that event, uh, letting go. So, Jonathan, my good friend, thank you for sending this in. And how dare you make me cry on the finale episode of this season? How dare? But in all seriousness, knowing you and the expressive, beautiful creature that you are, this dream and experience really affected me. It's also a good reminder that these small acts of hate, fear, or bullying that come at us are done by other humans that may and most likely are enduring some trauma themselves. The fact that Nelson shared a bit of what he was going through when he was younger was not an excuse, but does give context to where that hate was coming from. Him wearing the overalls is honestly the most beautiful thing I've ever heard, and I think was him showing you how sorry he was. And maybe the overalls are cute as hell. Who knows? Honestly, if it's you, Jonathan, they probably were cute as hell. Regardless, thank you for sharing, and I know this was helpful for more than just me. Okay, listeners, we got one more dream, baby. Now, this last one I say for the end because I was in the dream, and I maybe sounded like a cult leader, which scared me and made me not want to play it, but, babe, I'm going to play it anyway because I'm not ready to start a cult. Although, if I was... All of our outfits would be teal, and we would probably live on a sanctuary in Iowa or Maine. I love Maine, besides the fat toes. Okay, here's the dream. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> I like your voice. My name's Colleen. Um, Mike, I took an improv class with you a really long time ago, and oh, I was funny. at your Beyond Lunch party thing night, which was fun, and we got to say hi. But anyway, so I did have a dream two nights ago 
and you were in it, so I figured <laughs> I should submit. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so I had a dream that you were running some sort of like workshop that was parallel to to the podcast that you're doing, and it was just all women, and you were like leading it. And when I walked in, I was like telling you how I've been meaning to send you an email about your podcast, which I really have been meaning to do, and I will do. Um, I was telling you about, you know, how my mom recently passed away and my journey since then, which has been a crazy spiritual awakening. It's, I have a lot of notes on things that have been happening. Um, so your podcast really has been so aligned with what I like and what I want to hear. And it's just been like my Tuesday morning ritual and I'm so happy you did it. So there, okay. <laughs> so I said a lot of that stuff in the dream. And uh, afterwards, you're like, you are a perfect human. <laughs> it's like, wow, I felt really good. Um, conceited in my dreams? I don't know. So I went to go sit down at the mm. table. It's like a table of six women, uh, three on either side. And I walked by you and you said something to me. And I was just like, yeah, but like, I didn't really hear what you said. And then when I sat down, I realized you said, I have no idea what I'm doing today. Something, someone canceled. I don't have anything planned. I was supposed to have someone come in. So I sat down and we had all these dried like flowers and lavender at the table. And we were making little piles and, on like pieces of paper that we had in front of us. And I was kind of looking at the, the girl across from me and the girl diagonal to me and was wondering if I should mirror what they were doing. So either there was like a, a pattern or something where it made sense. They had already started. I don't know. So I was looking around and then you kind of stopped and you're like, all right, let's just do something. Does anyone have like a question? They're, they're burning to ask the universe or whatever. And I felt like, like you wanted me to volunteer. Um, so I raised my hand and you're like, okay, Callie. And for some reason we had decided that my name should be Callie for the show or the class, because there was another Colleen or the name, I don't know. And in my head, I was like, oh, great. So I will be anonymous if for some reason this gets used for the show. <laughs> so I'm on your show in my dream. So then suddenly there was a woman there to assist in this exercise. And she showed me how to sit. Like, So I had to sit in front of the room against the wall. And I had to kind of have one leg stretched out to the side and then the other leg bent like like Indian style. Um, and I had to place one of my hands on my elbow, kind of like I was holding on to it a little bit or something. And then she was just like, okay, sit and get really quiet. And I did really easily, which I wasn't expecting. Like I was just suddenly comfortable in front of the room and I got really quiet. And Somehow I was seeing the room, even though my eyes were closed, and everyone looked bored, but I was okay with it. And um, I asked the question, should I have a kid now, or should I keep working on myself and building a career? Um, and all I heard was kid, 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 kid. And I felt totally relaxed, and when I was done, and I opened my eyes, I looked around and everyone still looked really bored. <laughs> everyone was like kind of playing with their phone or whatever. And I felt weird and I went back to my seat and I was just like really wanting to know who my six spirit guides were. Um, and everyone still seemed bored. And then, um, and that was it. And yeah, that's how it ended. God, there's so much richness in this dream. So much. Sir, so first of all, let's start with the idea that that one way of working with dreams is that everybody in the dream is a reflection of you, mm -hmm. the dreamer, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this you in her dream isn't you. It's not it's not your dream, it's mm -hmm. her dream. She met you in improv, which means you vibrate with her as somebody who reflects her consciousness of comedy, doing improv. Uh -huh. But now you're doing a spiritual podcast. <laughs> so you also represent a spiritual curiosity for her. Not only do you represent a spiritual curiosity for her, you represent both. 
a kind of expression that's through comedy and then uh-huh. expression through spiritual exploration, which, as, uh-huh. as you know, I believe are the same thing. Yes. Creativity yes. and spiritual expression, they are the same thing. Same right. thing. So it's her dream. You are showing up as the part of her that can move in the direction of her own. What did she say? She says, I'm having a crazy spiritual awakening. Uh-huh. Well, yes. And yes. the dream is exhibiting that. Uh-huh. So when she's curious about why did she know that she had six spiritual guides it's because the room the 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 dream starts out with six women Uh, so they're those women morphed from the women in the workshop towards the end they become the 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 spiritual guides six by the way in numerology uh is the number where marriage partnership connection with others in family making comes up You've got this evolution of numerology, one singularity, we split off to two to have to relative other. When Uh you have relative other, you can create, that's three. Once you have creativity, you create foundation, that's four. Five is freedom and expression on top of that foundation. Then we are ready to share in marriage, connection, and community with others. That's the number of six. Uh Then seven is spiritual consideration because that's when we look up. When we look up, we learn about abundance and Uh prosperity. That's eight. And then nine is completion. So six is the number where we are considering what it's like to be in community with others. And that can include Mm -hmm. partnership and procreation. Um. My favorite piece is when you look at her and you say, you are a perfect human being. Mm -hmm. And her response is to to negate that. She negated it in her narrative Mm -hmm. of telling you the dream in the voicemail. She's saying, oh, yeah, I'm so conceited in my dreams. It's like, honey, listen to me. You listen to this podcast? You are a perfect human being. That is not conceit. That is truth with a capital T. Mm -hmm. And this dream is taking you through that knowing, that journey, that knowledge, that as someone who's having a crazy spiritual awakening, you are coming into knowing the truth of yourself, which is you are a perfect human being. Mm -hmm. So the idea that towards the end of the dream, as she's expressing her perfection as a human being, Mm -hmm. what is she perceiving? Boredom in others. Mm. Now, that's not their dream. Mm -hmm. It's her dream. So who are those bored people? Mm -hmm. They're the thoughts inside of her that Mm -hmm. dismiss her perfection, her spiritual curiosity, and her movement. They're bored. They're distracting themselves with their phones. That's the part of her that's distracting herself from her magnificent journey towards becoming a perfect human being. Uh Uh-huh. I'm upset. I mean, yes. Yes. So, Michael. Yes. (laughs) When we're listening to this dream... She said the mirror across the table, there were these women with these lavender flowers at the table and they were almost doing something with their hands and they were almost mirroring each other across the table. She was mirroring them. Isn't that what yes. she said? Yes. She was, so she was being shown. She's being shown a couple of things in this dream. One is, here's the process. These women are mm-hmm. showing her with the flowers and the movement. I would liken that to, here's a ritual you can do. Here's the way you can move through life in a more conscious way. There's another place where more of that is happening in what I would interpret as ultimately mudras. A mudra mm-hmm. is a body posture that's designed to move energy. We find this in yoga. So putting fingers together mm. in these funny little shapes that, that people will make fun of, mm-hmm. you know, to, to show meditation. Oh, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. putting my fingers together. And mm-hmm. I, that's a mudra. It's a placing the body in a particular position to have the energy move in a particular way. So mm-hmm. the leg out and other leg in and the way that part of the dream, I was both of these, the table and the mirroring and the moving of the body to me is saying to the dreamer, you have guidance in side of you. Your spiritual guides tell you how to behave, how to act, how to move, how to ritualize, how to practice your burgeoning spirituality. You can't just have spiritual awakenings and say, well, that was fun. You must let it inspire you Mm -hmm. into practices that allow you to cultivate, nurture, and sustain the openings that the spiritual awakening creates. Mm -hmm. It's bad news when you have a spiritual awakening, kids, (laughs) because there's lots of work to do when it's done. Yes. Something I am taking away from doing all of this is there was a through line with the mirror in the first dream we listened to. I also think, you know, there's synchronicity in us meeting in me playing these in the specific order that That's I play right. them for you. That's right. There's a through line. There's some message. And doing this whole process has been um, 
like really my I'm sharing my awakening That's with right. other people. That's right. And it's like a ceremony. Yes. And people are responding to that, Mike, yes. because you're doing it authentically. It's real. And yes. there's a rawness to it and and a messiness to it that uh-huh. is compelling. And that's why the podcast is successful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's because people are drawn to what you're sharing. Yes. Well, that's nice to hear. That's kind of like what I'm taking from this yeah. is, hey, I, I first had dreams and then we did the, you know, we shared the medium episode first and people were like, I have dreams. And so I don't think it's a mistake that our finale of the season one is including other people in my kind of mirror existence image of what beyond is kind of a mirror for other people's yes you're freaking out yes well, and i yeah. live <laughs> yeah. i get to live uh-huh. in that clarity of oh my god look what's happening every day uh-huh. and that's what you will get to live in mike that's what you're cultivating you're cultivating having that wild experience of oh my god you cannot make this up mm-hmm. every day that's the value yeah. of the spiritual awakening. And yes, it's scary. Yes, you do have to die in ego death. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's terrifying. It's a little messy too. But oh my God, what's on the other side of it is just so delicious. Colleen, girl, thank you for sending this dream in. And I'll tell you this, just as it's been scary for me to not make a joke every time I brought up spirit guides or energy vortex or past lives, you have to stop judging yourself and be open to the more vulnerable side of yourself. I remember taking improv class with you, and on top of you being incredibly funny and reminding me of Kristen Wiig, you were also super empathetic and took on other people's energy. So girl, we empath sisters. And back to Michael, after all this great dream analysis, I asked Michael if he had one final takeaway for my listeners who may also be having vivid dreams. So he answered, and you're going to hear that answer now. So one of the things that's really funny about doing what I do out in the world is like, you know, I hear a dream and then I offer an interpretation. It usually lands. People have an experience because I I know what I'm doing. Right. And then that looks like what dream work is, but that's not the case. That's one way of working with the dream. And it does require working with somebody else who knows what they're doing. The dream just wants your attention. It's, it's part of you, right? And it's part of the mystery of you. It's the unconscious part of an individual. And what we really want to cultivate is having a relationship with that part of us. So just having a dream is getting us in touch with our unconscious psyche and having a bridge between the unconscious and the unconscious mind. It knows what it's doing. You, If you never remember a dream, you will still die more wise and evolved than you started. And part of that is because of having dreams. Remembering a dream elevates what's possible because it's the unconscious saying to you, pay attention, right? So you remember it, there's something to that, we we think, right? So writing it down takes it even a step further. Now you're having a relationship with the dream. You're doing dream work. You're already doing it just by virtue of thinking about the dream after you've had it. Sharing it with another human being takes it yet to another level of heightened possible you know, outcome of marinating with the dream because now you're involved and engaged in a, in a connection with another human being that elevates it even more. To me, the, the highest way of working with the dream is to do something creative in response to the dream. Draw, write a poem about it. You know, uh, uh, take some aspect of the dream and celebrate it in a, in a creative way. That's, again, furthering the dreamer's relationship with the dream without having to land on some aha like I do. That's not the old, that's not the end game. The end game is to simply have the relationship with the dream state in that way. And if you want to increase what's possible there, then it becomes a matter of setting intention as part of your you know, sleepy time ritual. You know, preparing for bed and saying to yourself, hey, higher self, I want some dreams tonight. Oh, uh, how about this? I'm working on this relationship or I'm having this challenge with a decision I have to make or I don't know what to do here or there. Dreams, do you have any information for me? You know, send them tonight and, you know, let me know what, what, you know, how I should move next. Right. So the intention setting becomes key. Putting the recording device next to your bed is also very important, whether you're going to write them down with, you know, pen and ink or record them with a 
digital device, if you if you have any obstacles between you and that recording process, you're going to wake up too full and you're less likely to remember the dream. And the third most important thing about increasing the dream experience is write something down even if you don't have a dream that you've remembered. That act of putting pen to paper as a, again, intentional response in the morning triggers the unconscious mind to keep the window open longer. So you might have to write, I don't remember anything from last night, but that act will increase the likelihood that the next night and the next and the next, your dreams will stay more, uh, you know, present in your memory as you, you know, face waking up. And then I left. I said goodbye to Michael and left him in the studio with Joe, one of the best producers in all of podcast history, next to Alex. And I left, and I gave him a specific task. I said, leave me a message that you would like me to hear when this episode comes out. So this is part of the recording that I will genuinely not hear until it goes live. My producers will hear, but I will not, and I have no idea what it is even though my final wrap-up will be after it. And maybe there'll be some synchronicities, but also maybe not. I just think it's going to be fun to do this. That's why I'm doing it. Either way, this is what he said. Well, I mean, I think the, the success of the podcast has been driven by Mike's journey. Right. And so I would, I would really say this almost sounds like a cop out answer because I could have said something that was really more about like, you know, what my journey is. But the fact is that the podcast is working because Mike is using his journey to inspire his next sort of conversation. And there's a participation that the greater energy, the mystery or spirit is having with this. And he's seeing that happen as he watches it unfold, as he's watching the synchronicity of, oh, this show, then the medium show, then the dream show, final show. Oh my God, all of the ways that the dreams he chose lining up, that kind of synchronicity can't be underestimated, the power of that, right? And so that's what, that's the advice I would give is absolutely follow that trail. Start with, well, what are you interested in? What are you tripping on? What is your challenge at the moment? What's your victory of the moment? If Mike honors that exclusively, the, the, the world will reward him for that transparency. I want to thank Michael Lennox for being a part of this very special season one finale and for making me laugh so much in the studio. If you want to book a session with Michael, all of his info will be in the episode description. And if you want to just follow him on Facebook, he does the absolute best Facebook lives I have ever seen. Seriously, they are amazing. Now, I don't think it was by accident that the finale episode of the season was more about you, the listeners, because throughout this entire season, I have realized that what started as a vulnerable and open dive into the beyond ended up being more of a conversation between me, my spirit guides, some incredible experts in this field, and you, the listener. The stories we've shared and the lessons we've learned are not just mine, but seem to be universal. From connecting with my grandpa Bob, one of my spirit guides, to clearing the basement of Cure Thrift Shop, to sharing my Saturn return story, based on the messages I've received, I've realized that all these things are not isolated to me. Because it's not all about me. Thank you, Carol. But in fact, we are all having these experiences, learning these lessons, and connecting with others, whether they be alive, past, or living in a slightly ugly vintage dresser that Andrew got for me. Now, all of these episodes are a peek into my life and a small window into the beyond. And my hope starting this was to give a relatable voice to these woo-woo concepts that constantly get shat on. Like mediums, witchcraft, ghost stories, because there is nothing worse than opening yourself up to others about the night your grandfather's spirit visited you in your college apartment to have them instantly tell you that it's bullshit. So if anything... I hope this pod made you feel a little less alone for being the one in your friend group who likes that weird stuff. So thank you for making me feel Gucci. Yeah, Gucci. Thank you for subscribing, rating, reviewing, sharing with your friends and family. And if you know someone that's into this stuff or is maybe struggling with the loss of a loved one, a tough Saturn return, or has a haunted dresser that their partner got without their consent, babe, you gotta send them this pod. And finally, 
for those of you asking, yes, there will be a season two, okay? <laughs> Ouch. And yes, season two will be beyond. And no, I'm not starting a cult, but I would love to hear from you in the meantime. So please email me at beyondpodcastfd at gmail.com and let us know what you loved about season one and what things you would love for me to explore in season two. And maybe you have a story that our listeners would find valuable. Let us know, reach out. And if you're feeling alone, stressed and without hope, leave some pretzels and Diet Coke out because Grandpa Bob is on his way. Goodbye. Forever Dog. This has been a Forever Dog production. Executive produced by Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. For more original podcasts, please visit foreverdogpodcasts.com and subscribe to our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep up with the latest Forever Dog news by following us on Twitter.